Hey there everybody, thank you for joining me for another one man review. Today I've got Dash Shaw's Bottomless Belly Button from Fanagraphics. It's one of the last few books uh, that I have left to read from what the books that I picked up from the Fanagraphics Fanabucks sale. I pre-ordered everything from Fanagraphics that I wanted for the rest of the year and then used the gift cards to buy things like this that I've been wanting for a while and other things on their site that popped out that looked good. Uh, I'm I'm a real big fan of Dash Shaw's work, but I've always thought about him as more of like a formalist or someone who's really experimental with their art. And so I was surprised to see this book. A, it's a it's huge. It's a huge book. It doesn't have page numbers, but it's got to be six seven hundred pages. Um, and there's a lot of cool formalist stuff in here and stuff like this where there's white ink on the this cardboardy paper and black ink. So stuff that I typically think of when I think of Dash Shaw, but this is like really, really an emotionally powerful um, piece of literature, piece of fiction, uh, like genreless fiction. It's just a story. I guess it fits into a genre. I was just talking to um, Edo Brenna as, as I had been reading this uh, about uh, Kingdom, and I was talking about this genre of like families visiting the beach and this falls into that genre, but it's it's just a straight up family drama. And again, you know, if you've been following the channel, that's drama is the thing I think I'm most interested in right now. It's the it's the thing that I find most compelling. So this book is awesome as a piece of writing too. And and now there's a few other Dash Shaw books. I have a lot of his stuff, but I got I got to pick up his other ones. Uh, I was sad that Fantagraphics didn't have cosplayers because I wanted to get that. Um, so one thing that I really like about this book is it says right out the gate, it says this book's in three parts, take breaks. I like that, that he's kind of saying, I want you to digest the work and not blow through. Uh, even though it's a big book, you could blow through because it reads pretty fast, but I like that he's enforcing breaks. Um, he starts out with a, a convention of uh, categorizing things. Like there's many types of sand and he goes on to do a bunch of different sand because it's going to be, you know, a family meeting in a beach house. Then he, he uses that to say there's different types of the loony family as well. Um, and I think that's really smart because there are different configurations of a family depending on who's there, uh, depending on what's going on. Like families fall into different modes. And I think that's a really smart observation on his part. And that's the kind of smart uh dramatic stuff that goes on throughout the whole book uh, this real cute observation of human behavior and characterization some of his formalisms come into play i like this the uh the the parents are getting kind of frisky in the kitchen here and you see the kids can only kind of hear and put together what's going on so he uses the little dashes um he talks about the black hole loonies in which each separate member is someone on their own and they're not part of the family unit. And again, you know, that I think really shows like uh, that sets, mathematical sets like can include and take things apart and they can constantly change. And even within a set, you know, there's like subsets and uh, that's really smart. So the plot of the, the book is just that this family's coming together because the parents have um, decided to get a divorce after 40 years of being married, which is in, in, intense. And here you can even see this mathematical kind of representation of a dense cross section with each type of loony family combined, and it makes a whole pie. And um, now, you know, that the family is uh, getting divorced, it's it's uh, altering it to, to focus more heavily on the the black hole loonies, the isolated loonies, where everyone's going to have to deal with kind of their own issues about mom and dad getting divorced after 40 years. Um, and then I like the transition to the actual pie that's on the table um, at the, the dinner where the parents are announcing this. So you've got all, all of the characters. You've got their three children, uh, Dennis and his wife, Aki, and then Jill and her daughter, Claire, and then Peter. And then you have the mom's Marion and the dad is David, I believe is their names. But the three kids are kind of the main characters that you'll follow, Jill and Aki as well, but as they deal with the fallout. So um, 
I, I like as they announce it, it devolves into the scene where there's a lot of noise and a lot of crosstalk going on as the baby starts crying and someone starts coughing. And there's just a really good visual of all of the noise building up and um, this really important moment being announced kind of falling apart because of just day to day chaos of, you know, things going wrong, the table lighting on fire. And someone asked the dad, why, why are you doing this? You've been married 40 years. And they said, well, you, we're just not in love anymore. And then you go to this empty blankness here, just like it cuts through everything and shatters everything. Uh, really good visual representation of that. And then the characters get split off into their like own little black holes. And you got, start to see the different types of characters. So you have Dennis and his wife, Aki. And Dennis spends the whole book like really... He can't handle this. He can't figure out why his parents would do that. And that's his story throughout the book. Um, Jill has been divorced from her husband. Uh, or sorry, Claire has been divorced from Jill's dad. So she, she's, she's kind of reflecting on that, but doesn't really have a problem with it. Um, their story doesn't seem to change much. A lot of this seems to be about how the characters change. And as would be in real life, it affects some of them more than others. And then you have Peter, who's kind of like the stoner artsy outcast kid of the family. And I think Peter kind of has the biggest arc or he's just my favorite character throughout the book. He's kind of funny. Um, I think Dennis is the most emotionally interesting character and Eki kind of as well. Um, I, I won't totally get into everything. I mean, obviously it's a big book. Uh, this is one we could talk about for a long time. Um, so just some formal things that I like in it and some little things that jump out to me. Uh, they He definitely uses documents within the comic. So there's letters that are actually part of the story. I always like that when it shows up in comics. That's a trick I've liked for a long time. And then after talking to my buddy Brian Davis in that episode where we're talking about multimodal books as, as archives. Now I kind of think about that, you know. Comics are already multimodal, but they, when they have this archive kind of aspect to them embedded in the story, I really like that. Um, some of these documents that Dennis finds, he, he finds this uh, hidden, he, he's finding lots of like hidden remnants of the family around the house. Um, so like this, this photo book here, scrapbook of the family, and it has this in it, which I believe is a rebus. You know, something where it's be like lamp, C, bulb here. I don't, I, I couldn't interpret the rebus, but I think that's what it was. Or it's definitely some kind of code because the parents write to each other in code at some point. Um, and, you know, just these kinds of things, these little drawings. And even the photos, func they're, they're not panels. They work kind of like panels, but they're also um, documents in, in the archive. So I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on with comics there and uh, kind of shows where some other possibilities like I would love to see just a photo album as a comic or I like to think about photo albums and scrapbooks as comics. So that's cool. Um, there, this is the scene where Dennis finds like this hidden. There's a couple hidden passageways in the house and he's going down it and finds some more scrapbook and letters. This scene actually. Uh, he gets this big splinter in his hand while craw crawling through it. And that actually made me do an actual like uh, wince while I was reading, which is very rare that I, I react physically to books like that. So that's just shows Dash Shaw's power as a cartoonist and that he can kind of suck me in into what's going on with Dennis crawling down this weird little passageway that's hidden in a closet uh, into the attic or whatever. And I'm so sucked into that. It's like he can almost get a jump scare out of me. Here's where he finds the, um, he's finding the this box full of letters in this passageway. And again, you see that uh, the father was in the military and he's writing letters to the mother. This is stuff when they were kids, Maggie and David. And um, to communicate, to make it past her father, checking on the letters, they do come up with codes. So that justifies that Rebus earlier as like something that, that was going on between them. Uh, and there's eventually a letter from Maggie where she talks about um, having decoded this and says something about the, the bit about the belly button. And um, I think that's, you have to solve this to understand what the title of the book means. I like making puzzles. I don't like solving puzzles very much. It's a weird, lazy thing, or I don't know, like the mental works more fun to me to try and figure out how to make a puzzle. 
So I'm not the type of person that's going to go break this. If anyone that's watching this has figured this out and sees what it says, or maybe I should just search on the internet, I have a feeling like the title of the book makes sense if you can break this. And I like that there's unresolved mysteries in the book because it's like life. And the, the narratives, it's not like a typical plot structure where there's like a resolve at the end. And that seems to be part of this visit to the beach genre uh, when I think of Kingdom, when I think of this book, when I think of Bastien Vives' uh, A Sister. There's always these characters that come into your life for like a few days at the beach and they leave some kind of impact but they're never a part of you again. Or there's these events that happen and they may or may not change a character and that's really all that goes on in any kind of narrative arc really in terms of plot are these small changes that may or may not happen on a trip like that. And I, I like that format. It's making me think a lot more because it's just so focused on character. Um, you know, you have to be a really good writer to pull that off. So I'm really impressed by Dash Shaw with this book. And I'm thinking about the genre, that genre or that approach of like just dipping into someone's life for three days and dipping out. And it may or may not be uh, a really important three days or an impactful for the rest of their life. It's interesting. Um, all throughout the book, Peter's represented with this frog face and everyone else looks real. And, you know, I mean, we're like probably 450, 500 pages in and you just assume that's how Dash Shaw has chosen to draw this character. And he, he has met, Peter's met this girl on the beach and kind of having like a fling with her and falling in love with her a little too quick. Um, I, like I said, I think he, his character probably goes through the most change over the course. Or there's the most like standard arc with him, so it's easier to latch on to. Uh, but I like that in this one panel, Shaw breaks it because uh, he's Peter's admitting to this girl, like, I'm the youngest child. I don't belong. My whole family looks at me like I'm a dumb, weird frog. Do I look like a frog to you? Sometimes I think I look like a frog. And then you see him for what he really is for one panel. And I like that. I like that he was willing to just let this character be for that long, just assuming, okay, whatever, you know, it's a comic, you can kind of accept those things. And then he has like a really good emotional reason for it that pays off. And that's how everything works in this book. Um, there's all these emotional payoffs. And obviously, there's just lots of lots of stuff that I'm skipping in terms of the actual inner workings of the characters. But, you know, go read it yourself. It's a great book. Um, I really like this bit of dialogue here, but uh, it's also something I find puzzling. The the grandma or the, the mom who's divorcing uh, Claire's grandma is talking to her um, and tells her your spirit. She's talking to her about feeling like she's the same person now. She's just old and wrinkly. She's talked about that a few times in the book. And she says, your spirit never changes. It's the only thing that's always with you. You move cities, get older, lose a leg. The only thing that's you is your spirit. And then Claire's like, yeah, that makes sense. And then the mom says, someone told me that once and I liked it. And I thought that was a really smart conversation in the book um, because I immediately, from my perspective, wanted to disagree with it. A, it's like, I don't believe in a spirit. So I believe in like a personality, you know, I, I have a personality and my personality is fairly consistent, but I've changed. Like, you know, I joke with Tori all the time. What would younger me think of me now? Like there's parts of me now that younger me would look at and be like, that guy's a douchebag. That guy's an asshole. And I look at younger me and, you know, think like, well, he just didn't know what he's talking about, you know? So like, I think we can really, really change over time. But I think this is coming from a character who hasn't changed that much. And that's in this story. There's some characters that don't change that much. You know, Claire gets a haircut over the, the course of the, the weekend, but that's probably about as much impact as this weekend has on her. Um, whereas Dennis goes into a total crisis and Peter has this like a little love affair. So it's, I think that's in there, not as a, a statement from Dash Shaw about spirit. I think it's in there as him honing in on the mom as someone who doesn't change that much. And it pays off a little bit later in uh, Dennis's crisis, too, where he talks about his mom being uh, someone he he, fig he thinks he's figured it out that his his mom just stuck with the family to keep the family together. And, 
now she needs to go be herself. And his Aki, his wife, is like, that doesn't sound like your mom at all. Maybe you're talking about someone else. Um, and that this is like a key there for that as well. There's a few things that are weird to me that Dasha does throughout the book. One is he'll oftentimes note like an action. Uh, it, it's like he feels like we wouldn't get what's going on by the rest of the context. And it's an interesting thing a comic can do, but most of the time when he's shown it, I almost feel like he just is compensating for what he thinks is like poor art on his part or something. Like he's not confident enough to show it. Like, even though I think with like a click were, you know, I think I could have got it. Like, I think I understand what's going on there. Um, without him telling me garage door opening. So it's a it's a weird thing that works in some spots, but it draws me out of the story and others. Probably my only complaint. Um, he does it again here with color. There's this, well, let's see. There's this scene here. No, maybe I didn't put it on. Yeah, here, where he's saying there's pinks, 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 purples, blues, purples, blues. And it's funny... I don't know. It's a funny thing to do in a book that it's an interesting production on this book too. It's almost like a warm brown ink instead of a black. I, I like that. Um, it's weird to want to stuff color in there so bad. I don't know if he just liked the joke of like talking about color in a book that doesn't have color or if you really wish that one scene could be in color. But to me, it's just it flips a little bit too much into comics and distracts me in the way that the other tricks don't. Um, like here he's talking about dry skin, clammy dry skin. And like, I get that. That's not stuff you could necessarily show very easily. Um, this is the scene where Dennis goes for a run. And as far as I can tell, he kind of has a panic attack or he just gets exhausted. And he has this vision where he supposedly figures out, you know, why his parents uh, got divorced. But when I was reading it, I thought, oh, this is a panic attack. It looks like a panic attack. Uh, it, it feels like a panic attack to me, um, especially right here where he's got blown out vision and then he has tunnel vision and he's like shaking his hand and stumbling and hyperventilating and stuff. Um, I really like that because I at different times in my life have really struggled with panic attacks and this feels like a really good visual representation of it. And some of that does have to do with, in this case, Dash Shaw noting the skin going dry and then getting clammy. Those things, I get why he's noting them. But also, like, you know, paying attention to, like, this kind of just detail about what happens. I think, you know, this, I, I don't need those notes. It's kind of, oh, I get it. I get that shakiness. So you see his, his power as a cartoonist. Um, and then he has this vision here uh, where he sees the mom changing. But it's also suggested maybe that it's achy. And he talks to her about, you know, the vision he had. And there's a moment between them where you realize that one of the two of them, uh, you know, it's like maybe she genuinely loved dad at first. I don't know. Maybe she's been with other guys flirting around. I don't know who divorced to, but it's mom's fault. And then she's like, oh, Dennis, do you, do you honestly think you're talking about mom right now, about Maggie? Because it doesn't sound like her at all. And that's confirmed by that other scene where she feels like she's been the same person forever. And then Aki pauses and um, you get this big stare in between them and this, this stare of their child as well. And you realize that there's now been a fracture put into their relationship. So that's what I'm talking about. Like Jill and Claire show up, not much happens. It's a big moment for them. Peter has like this this fling, but you don't really know like if he's going to be the same guy when he leaves or not. And I like that. That seems so acutely, so well observed, as Sean would like to say, and so, so well written. Um, and then at the end, there's just some really heartbreaking scenes where, like, you see the parents who they've been together for 40 years and they don't hate each other. They're a really good team. They have these routines that they can do without talking. And, um, you know, you see them as a, as a functional unit still. And then here, uh, you know, they're telling each other how much they're going to miss each other. No, you don't understand. I'm going to miss you so much. I'm going to miss you like crazy. I'm going to miss you more. I'm going to miss you so much. Uh, and then they say goodbye. And like, you know, that got me choked up in that moment. That's, in that's intense. Like after 40 years together, all this care, raising a family, having these routines, 
And you don't ever really get an answer in the book to why they did it. Um, just like the kids never get an answer. And there's these un unresolved mysteries of these puzzles and stuff. And I, I kind of like that. Like, I want to know why it's called Bottomless Belly Button. I want to know what the joke is. But it's like, you know, that's real life stuff. I, I'm enjoying this kind of narrative more than the things where every little thread's tied up. Um, life stays open even if you go all the way till the end you know like the dad says he thinks he's gonna die soon and and uh, it, it, there's things that will never be resolved and that's that seems right to me um, so really love this book I also like at the end that the dedications and the thanks are actual characters and thanks to the fanographics team and drawing the people there um, I think that's a fun way to do it it's like way more time put and thought put into it than just jotting down a, a name. So I think that's cool. And such a touching book about family and people and relationships. I think that's a really smart choice too. So I can't recommend this book enough. I mean, I really, really have always liked Dash Shaw, but um, out of all the stuff that I've read, there, like I said, there's a few things I haven't read, but man, this is a powerful piece. And it really shows uh, his ability, not as a cartoonist, but as a really, really good writer and a really, really good observer of just humanity in general. So I would recommend this book for for anyone and I'll recommend it to uh, a number of people, I'm sure. One of the best ways that you can support what we're doing here on the channel is to support the books that Sean's putting out through Living the Line. Uh, the first book that he put out is The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. It's a collaboration between Dave Sim and myself. Uh, the book was recently nominated for an Eisner Award in the best reality-based category. It's a deep, deep dive into the artwork and methods of Alex Raymond and the mystery surrounding his death in a car crash. So if you haven't grabbed that already, please do. There's also Yokoyama Yuichi's Plaza, which is a totally intense manga by an artist who has somehow figured out how to distill manga down to its purest essence. This book was successfully funded on Kickstarter, but if you missed the Kickstarter, you can order it through any comic store, any bookstore, Amazon, any any place that you would normally get your graphic novels from. The Abolition of Man is a five-issue mini-series done by myself and Sean in collaboration with the Mid-Journey AI. Uh, what you're seeing here is the cover to issue one and the first couple pages of issue one. This first issue, we fed it an essay by C.S. Lewis, and this is just the imagery that the computer spat back at us. Issues two and three are a narrative, starting with the story that I wrote when I was 21, and then Sean's going to write issue three, pick, picking up where I left off. Uh, in this one, I'm kind of trying to force the AI to give me the images I want, and then doing some tweaking in Photoshop to get these kind of colored looks on it. For issue four, we're turning the task of writing over to the AI as well. So the AI has written the, the script and then we just put that into the Midjourney AI and it's turned out art. The script and the art is some of the absolutely most horrific stuff I've ever seen. We're a bit scared to even publish this issue. And I don't have any art to show for it yet, but Sean and I have decided to do a fifth issue of Abolition as well because we have someone who we're really, really excited to have on board um, providing an essay for that fifth issue that will illustrate and we'll announce more about that soon thanks for following along take it away jack you want to see all these books smash that subscribe button and the like button and the bell and then you get them